Hi, I'm Zach with HKN, and um, so recently we finished up a series on Maxwell's equations, um, and we're going to do a little bit more, um, a few more videos for our, say, like e &M kind of classes, e &M waves, um, dealing with electric and magnetic fields. Um, the one we're going to do this week we have um, something called uh, the Lorenz force, and it is it deals with um, electric charges in magnetic fields, um, and it has some pretty interesting implications. So we'll we'll work through um, what it means, and we'll do an example. So so we have this equation here, and we say that the vector force on a charge Q that's moving with velocity v in a magnetic field b. So the vector of the force is equal to q times v, um, where v is a vector, crossed with b, where b is a magnetic vector field. So, um, so the fact that this is a cross product here is, is important, interesting, and we'll talk briefly about what a cross product is. So let's say we have a vector x and a vector y. And we want to find their cross product. So we have a right hand rule for finding a cross product. Let's say that we want to find x, um, yeah, x cross y. What is that equal to? Um, so our right hand rule for determining the direction of our cross product is going to be we um, take the fingers on our right hand, point them in the direction of the first vector. So we're going to point them in the direction of x. Um, and then we try to bend them in the direction of the second vector. Um, so we're going to put our right fingers in the direction of x, bend them in the direction of y, and our thumb points in the direction of the result. So we do that with this, we get a result that's out of the screen, right? So our product here of this cross product would be in the, I guess in conventional um, coordinate system, it would be in the positive z direction. Um, or if we're looking at it, it would be pointing straight at us out of the screen. So um, that's just. Uh, a brief um, explanation of how the direction of a cross product works. And now we can see from that reasoning that the order that these are expressed in also matters, right? If we did y cross x, we would get y cross x in our thumb points into the screen. Um, and it, so our result would be pointing in the opposite direction. So keep in mind the order of this matters. So let's talk about specifically what this cross product means. I'll leave that. Um, so if we have a charge, let's say we have an electric charge, and it's moving with a velocity, um, moving with a velocity v, and it encounters some magnetic field. Let's say it encounters some magnetic field. Um, Say it encounters a magnetic field that's pointing straight out of the board. Um, what does, let's try to come up with a direction that this force would be in. So we have our Q, which is a scalar value. And we'll see later the sign of Q actually matters here. Um, we have V, which is a vector. And we have this B, which is also a vector pointing straight out at us. So what would this cross product result in? Um, this cross product would end up being Q times V, V, and then crossed with B, right? So we'd get a, if Q is positive, we would get a result that, a force result that points down. So there, a force would appear on this charge. Is that right? Yep. So, we can see from that, and it's always a cross product, right? So we can see that if our charge is moving 
our force is always perpendicular to the direction our charge is moving. And that kind of sounds something like something similar we might have learned in um, like kinematics, maybe in physics. Um, when we have circular motion, we have we always have a force that's acting at right angles to our motion. Um, so, so really, what this results in, if we have a a charge moving through a magnetic field, we get a something like centripetal force. We would get. Um, actually, let's just do our example, and we'll uh, we'll explain it a little better there. So. Um, also, as an aside, since we're, we know we're going to run into circular motion here, let's come up with a, an expression um, from kinematics and physics um, for centripetal force. So we know that um, force is always equal to our mass times some acceleration, right? Um, and in this case, we want our centripetal force. So it's going to be equal to the mass of our object times our centripetal acceleration. Um, we'll call that A sub C. And we also know um, we have an equation from physics for centripetal acceleration. This would be equal to mass. And when we're moving in a circular motion with, um, uh, I don't really like to call it velocity because our velocity is always changing when we're moving in a circle, but we have some speed. At any, at any instant in our motion around that circle, we'll have some velocity. And the centripetal acceleration will be v squared over the radius of the circle we're moving in. So this here is a, a term for centripetal force. So, so let's imagine, let's, let's draw a scenario here where we have, um, let's say we have the, uh, some boundary between um, a region where there is um, a magnetic field, say it's pointing out of the board at us. You get the idea. The, um, the magnetic vector field is all evenly distributed in this region, and there's no magnetic field here. And let's say that we shoot a particle into that region that's charged with charge Q, and let's say we know the velocity it's moving at on its way in. Let's say we accelerated it up to some speed, and we know what its speed is at right as it enters that region. Um, now, as we talked about, as soon as it gets in here, it's going to experience a force, right? And the force is always going to be perpendicular to its motion. So it's going to get in here, it's going to experience a force. Um, either in this direction, that direction, depending on what charge it has. And so that'll change its direction a little bit. And then it'll be moving this way, say. And it'll experience a force that's still perpendicular to its motion. So it'll change its direction a little more. And that's why we get circular motion. Our force at any time is, is perpendicular to our motion. So let's try to write some equations up. So let's use Lorenz's law or yeah, the, the Lorentz force equation, to um, find the force due to the charge and the velocity and the magnetic field. And then let's, re, um, let's set that equal to the um, centripetal force. Because in this case, they're, they're the same thing. We're, we're um, making a mass go in a circle with this force. So we'll say, for our case here, OK. So one other thing about cross products, the result is always perpendicular to the two other vectors. Um, and its magnitude, the length of the result, depends on the angle between these two. Um, we get that another way of expressing this would be, um, let's see, this would be equal to Q times V. Um, times b, the length of this. So actually, yeah, let's specify that. So the magnitude of our force 
we already reasoned through the direction. It's going to equal Q times V times B, where these are all just magnitudes now, times sine of theta, where theta is the angle between these two vectors. So let's just check on this scenario we've set up. In this case, we have the B field coming straight out of the board. And we have the V coming straight into it like this. So they're at 90 degree angles, right? So theta, in that case, is 90 degrees. And sine of 90 degrees is 1, right? So we can say for this particular scenario here um, that our, the magnitude of our force is equal to Q times V times B. And now we'll set that, we can set that equal to the magnitude of our centripetal force because we did reasoning about the direction it's going to be acting in. So let's say that force, let's call it force sub B for force magnetic. Um, we'll set that equal to force C, which is our centripetal force. And let's expand this. So we know that force sub B, this term, this is the force that our charge is experiencing. And we have a term up here for centripetal force. We have m times v squared over r. OK. So now we know that we would expect this to take some circular path through this region. And let's say, what did we say? We said we know q. We know V, and we know B. We know what the magnetic field is here. So let's try to, um, so really this is a setup for an experiment. Let's see what happens and try to figure out the mass of the particle from this. So we know we would expect this to, we'd expect this charge once it gets in this field to take some, some circular path, right? We'll do it both ways and then talk about why. Those are pretty terrible circles, but just imagine those are both half circles with both with radius r. So say that we um, shoot this particle in and then have some way of detecting where it exits. Let's say we detect an exit here, right here and detect an exit or detect an exit there. It'll be one or the other. And say we know the position where we shot it in, right? So we detect an exit here, and we measure the distance between, let's call it distance d, in between where it entered and exited. And now we know, we know from that, that detected distance, we know that d will be 2 times r, right? Um, the radius of the circle it took. So let's note that down. So say d is equal to 2 times r, or r is equal to d over 2. So now, given that we found where we exit, we should be able to find the mass of this particle. So we could say that, let's see, So we want to solve this equation for m. What do we get when we do that? We get that m is equal to q times r times b over, um, actually, we want to find it in terms of d, right? Because that's what we measured. So we get q times b times d over 2v. So if we set up our experiment in a way where we know these values here, we know the charge, we know we detected this distance, we know b and we know v, we should be able to find the mass of our particle. And this is actually something um, people use quite a bit to, um, it's actually how people have weighed um, really tiny particles like electrons and protons and whatnot. Um, also, you can sort, if you have similarly charged particles with different masses, you can sort them out because 
what do we have here? We have that the larger D is, the larger this detection distance is, or the, the larger R is, the larger our mass will be. So if we shoot different weights of particles in here, the heavier ones will come out farther up. Um, so let's talk about why we set it up like this. Um, so if we look back at our, we said the sine of Q matters, right? The, whether, it's, um, whether it's positive or negative. So if it's a positive Q, we'll get our, uh, a positive number times our velocity crossed with B. And that would result in a, a force perpendicular this way to V, right? And we would go in this arc. Now, if Q is negative, we, um, it really just flips the direction of the result. So it would get Q cross B in the negative of that. It would experience a force this way perpendicular to its motion. So um, a negative particle would end up up here. Positive particle would, uh, would end up down here. Um, so, OK, yeah, let's, uh, let's mention one other thing. Um, we might wonder what the velocity of our particle is when it leaves, whether it's sped up or slowed down. Um, and actually, the, um, we'll talk about why. But the answer to that question is that it maintains its speed. Um, the velocity coming in here, it never speeds up or slows down around that circle. It would leave with the same velocity entered with. And the physical reason for that is because this force here um, doesn't actually end up doing any work on the particle. So we never impart any extra energy to the particle. It just causes it to go in a circular motion. And why is that? We know that, um, we know that uh, uh, work is equal to force dotted with a distance. Um, and what does a dot product mean? That, me that measures how parallel two vectors are, right? So, um, so work only happens if our force acts in the same direction as our, as our um, change in position. So for like an incremental um, distance along this path here, for a, for a very short distance the particle moves, we know that the force would be acting at right angles to it, right? We know the force would be always be acting, pushing in on the particle this way. And the force, so the force dotted with the distance, um, when you have two vectors at a 90 degree angles, um, the dot product of them is zero, right? So for any increment along this path, the work is zero. The total work through that path is zero. So we would expect the particle to have the same amount of kinetic energy once it leaves as it did when it went in. And, um, and as it turns out, that's what, that's what happens if you actually did this experiment. So um, that's it for this week. Um, see you next week. Thanks.